Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. We are going to take a walk through the basic fundamentals of an ASRock B365M Pro 4 motherboard. I'm using a low-end device to lay the foundation of understanding electrical, digital, mechanical, engineering concepts in a low-end motherboard that will allow us to carry into server platforms, sophisticated storage platforms, any kind of hardware as you move up the chain of more and more complex hardware. What you learn here at the bottom end carries you very effectively as you learn more and more sophisticated hardware and obviously software that goes with it. IT professionals work primarily at their job with enterprise hardware. Very often they're also very comfortable with consumer hardware. So they have consumer motherboards. They also deal with enterprise hardware, desktops, laptops, when they go to work on the job. When you look at enterprise hardware, it's the most boring, unexciting hardware you've ever seen in your life. Lift the lid on a enterprise desktop, HP or Dell Optiplex and look inside and it's absolutely the most unexciting hardware you've ever seen. But when you put me in a situation that I have to support hundreds and hundreds of users, give me enterprise hardware any day over any consumer product you can buy. We need to understand why. We also need to look at consumer products and build an understanding of hardware so that when we support our users and the enterprise, we do it very effectively. Supporting users is what it's all about for us as IT professionals. And one of the key components is their desktop, laptop, monitor, printer, etc. We're going to look at the desktop and we're going to start with motherboards. I'm going to start with a consumer motherboard since they're much more complex than enterprise motherboards. Once we've mastered some fundamentals in the consumer motherboard, it's relatively straightforward to move to the enterprise. Tech Savvy Productions is a channel dedicated to IT students, newly hired IT professionals. I trained IT students for 20 years. I know what their life is, the stresses, the expectations, the struggles at home. I've been there. I've seen that. I also know what it's like to see the anxiety and stress as someone tries to enter the IT field. And once they enter, they're overwhelmed by the expectation that they know all this stuff and there's no way that they can. Everybody learns one day at a time. I encourage you to check out our channel. It's dedicated for you. We cover networking, firewall, server hardware, RAID, Windows troubleshooting, data center, fiber optics, switches. Check our video description on this video and I'll be linking you to some relevant content related to this topic. Let's begin to explore the difference between enterprise hardware and consumer hardware. When you go into Walmart, you go into Target, you go into Sam's, you go into whatever store you go into and you see the aisle where they got the technology, they've got the laptops, the desktops, all the gizmos. All of those brands and models change at a rapid cadence. They're almost every month you walk in there and there's a new model, a new brand, a new feature. They've got new chips inside, new components that requires new drivers, new configurations. And that's fine for the consumer, but it's a huge headache for the enterprise. When enterprise buys a desktop, they'll buy an HP Elite Model 800 that's produced in 2019. And the last production of that model is in 2022. The motherboard never changes from 2019, 2022. That motherboard, no matter whether you buy it when it first comes out or you buy it before it ends production, the same motherboard, same drivers, same hardware stays consistent during the production of that hardware device. So I can create an image and deploy my Windows image on that desktop and I can do that the entire year, no matter when I buy the hardware and it's going to work perfectly. Is my hardware boring? Yes, but it sure makes my job a lot easier. The cost of deploying my operating systems, my cost of repair is much, much lower due to the consistency of the device itself. Driver updates are not required except maybe a security or a bug fix issue. Now, enterprise desktop hardware 
is designed basically a focus on business requirements and that's it. It's designed for ease of repair. We call them toolless hardware. Now you may have to break out a screwdriver or a hex wrench at some point, but you can do a lot of repair without any tools. Intel also pushes to the enterprise what's known as the vPro chipset or the platform controller hub. This allows enterprises to manage their desktops even at night when no user is sitting at the desktop. When it's powered down, they can do firmware updates. They can run hardware diagnostics remotely and they're very reliable for the warranty period. If the warranty period is three to four years on that particular brand, they're going to make sure they design it so it lasts at least that long. Enterprise hardware is built on the concept of field replaceable units. They build it, they break it down into modules so they're easy to repair. You just pull out a module, replace that module, and the user is up and running. Dell does exactly the same and so does Lenovo. Now the consumer side has a lot of focus on the low end, low cost. They also have focus on the gamer side, high definition audio, dual graphic cards, faster ethernet, water cooled, powerful CPUs. But when it comes to consumer devices, many times they're difficult to repair and upgrade is very limited on them. You take that same device that is enterprise focused and it will have modular repairs. You can actually get a full blown step-by-step teardown on an enterprise laptop. Try finding that with a consumer product. They also have more flexible upgrade options. Now I'm going to use a consumer motherboard to begin. Why? Because one is more complex and the more complex motherboard that you understand, then it's relatively easy to move to the enterprise. When I taught students and when I work on hardware myself, I like to begin with a technique of putting my motherboard and building my PC on a desktop. I have a power supply over here in the corner. I have a surface in which I use to build the PC. I add the RAM, video card, whatever I'm going to do for that particular hardware, I build on an open desktop. I love this approach because it allows me easy troubleshooting, building. I can see everything. I can work very easily on all the connectors, jacks, and plugs, and it makes it very easy to get it up and running, tested, and verified that everything is working before I put it into a case. Now, when you do run a motherboard on a desktop surface, make sure you have an insulator once you energize this motherboard because you don't want this thing to short out in the bottom. You've got a lot of electronics exposed. Now, notice I've got my I've got all of my standoffs already set up into the motherboard. So they actually provide a slight lifting of the motherboard above the surface. So this is setting on the standoffs and I'm setting on an insulated board here. So I don't have to worry about shorting out the board once this motherboard becomes energized. When I begin this process, I'm using static bags, not an insulated board to protect the device from static. So don't throw away your static bags of all your components. Hang on to those because they make a great platform. When you begin this process, you want to make sure you have a anti-static surface to begin to work with these components. Now, in my case, one of the motherboards that I just recently purchased came in a box that looks like this. And if you're looking for an anti-static surface, if you notice when I open up the box, it actually says this cardboard has been sprayed with a special material that makes it anti-static. So you could actually take this cardboard out, lay it on a flat surface and build your motherboard on top of this anti-static cardboard. This will work great to begin your project. Once you energize it, then you have to remove all your anti-static material and start using some kind of insulator. And in my case, I've used standoffs to lift it up off this board. Again, just better protecting it while it's running energized. The circuit boards used with most motherboards are what's known as a glass epoxy printed circuit board. Now this one has been dyed a black color, but generally they're green. Printed circuit board itself is a complex multi-layer board. This circuit board that you see here, this is a top and that represents this part of the circuit board. The bottom of the board is represented by the bottom section of this cutaway view of that circuit board. There are multiple layers. Most motherboards have four to five layers of copper traces and connections in this thin edge of the motherboard. Many of your cell phone motherboards actually have 12 layers. 
Here you can see the standoff screw that you actually put in the brass standoff on the case. And they warn you not to tighten this too tight because you'll actually crush the fiberglass epoxy printed circuit board and can damage those multi-layer interconnections. Snug a good electrical contact, but don't crank it down. Your motherboarding case have very deliberately designed holes that are pre-drilled as well as standoffs in the case so that the motherboard mounts into the case and is screwed and supported by these standoffs. These case standoff screws are both brass and aluminum. They are very critical to giving you electrical ground. Now these precision holes that are drilled into the motherboard are very important pr to provide rigid support so that you can plug in your memory, your PCI Express cards, and not flex the board enough to damage it. You see exposed solder so that when you screw in the screw head, it will make good electrical contact and you'll get a good signal ground to your metal case. Now here was a gentleman who found himself in a situation where a standoff on his case missed the hole in the motherboard. This is the only time I would recommend a plastic standoff. It's better to have a plastic standoff here to give the motherboard support than not to, but it's always better to have a metal standoff if possible. What's interesting is you look at your motherboard, how much real estate of your motherboard is reserved for power supply. Now you may not think about power supply, but if you look at this picture, I've got my CPU socket and behind it, I've got a large heat sink. That heat sink sits on a DC to DC set of converters, voltage regulators and MOSFET chips that are critical to this DC DC power supply. We're going to take high voltage DC and bring it down to a volt or less. This is extremely complex to do and a lot of heat is generated, which is why this mass of aluminum heat sink is sitting on top of those voltage regulators. These devices here are capacitors and they are to provide the voltage stabilization that's needed for that power supply. These black boxes that you see behind the capacitors are inductors and they provide current stabilization. All around the CPU you see inductors, capacitors, and all of these are critical components that make up the DC to DC power supply that is critical for this CPU. Also around your RAM sockets, you'll see some more voltage regulators. Here we see a capacitor and inductor here at the top. And again, those are to provide some voltage stabilization, current stabilization, and an additional boost to keeping that voltage at low levels that it needs to be for your memory DIMMs. Some years ago, DC to DC converters on our motherboards looked more like this. You see the inductors here, the electrolytic capacitors, and these were notorious for failing because they used a liquid material called glycol as part of the chemistry of that cap. If there was any kind of reverse voltage or current on these capacitors, they would literally turn that liquid glycol into steam and they would ooze out either the top or ooze out the bottom of unwanted chemical material or literally blow the canister off the top of the motherboard. Anytime you saw raised tops on your electrolytics, it was dying or dead. They eventually replaced those aluminum electrolytics with a polymer-based material that no longer had any kind of fluid. They were very stable, very reliable, but very expensive. One very important concept is when you're building your motherboard for the first time, get enough RAM that you can boot it, put your heatsink on your CPU. Don't worry about an operating system or even a hard drive. If you need a video card, you have to have at least a video card to display. You could use the, in, the internal CPU video card if that's what you have. Don't worry about finishing or installing or getting an operating system. Let's get the heatsink properly installed, get enough RAM to boot it. And basically what we want to do is we want to get up to bias. One of the most important things that I want to verify is that the CPU temperature starts at some point and rises and then plateaus out. I don't want my CPU to overheat. And the only way that I can know is really monitor that for the first 20, 30 minutes while this is brand new, freshly installed. Did my thermal grease get properly applied? Is my heat sink, does it have enough pressure on top of the CPU? Adequately transfer that heat from the CPU to the heat sink. I want to pay very, very close attention to the temperature of my CPU. 
CPU. It should start off at a low temperature, continue to climb, and after about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, it should plateau. What I'm wanting to watch for is that the temperature of the CPU continues to climb. If it continues to climb, that tells me that heat sink or thermal grease or something is not properly attached or applied or whatever. Pay attention to that before you go any further in your PC build. It's also a good place to just let it run for the day. Remember, if the motherboard dies, you've, you haven't went any further than this. And you can always pack it up, put it in a package, and return the motherboard as basically a dead-on arrival or an infantile failure type of motherboard. If you put it into your case and then it dies, it's a much more difficult job to get it out and then package it up and put it away. Set your motherboard up, monitor the temperature, let it run for an entire day. Now you're ready to finish your assembly, install your hard drive, put your operating system, and again, maybe let it sit for a day just to see how it runs. Coming up is part two of understanding motherboards from the perspective of an IT professional in a workplace. We're going to look at jumpers, how to properly connect case jacks and plugs to the motherboard. I've seen a number of situations where smoke rises from the desktop because somebody didn't understand how to do that properly. We'll look at polarized jumpers. We'll look at keyed plugs. We'll find the firmware chip on our motherboard. What are crystals on a motherboard? We're going to check that out. We're going to look at M.2 Wi-Fi modules. M.2 solid state hard drives. We're going to look at why the platform controller hub chip is the most important chip on your motherboard and thermal paste and much, much more.